Yeah. Okay, so I am uh, Shama Chatterton. I'm from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, just down the road here. I will try and speak as loud as I can. I'll pretend I'm yelling at my children. <laughs> um, yeah, so I joined Ag Canada three years ago, actually on July 1st, so it's just about coming up to my three-year anniversary. Um, and I started working on pea root rots uh, about a year ago is when we started this big project. Um, I think when I first started coming out to crop walks, when I first arrived, um, it seemed to be the number one problem that I was hearing from a lot of growers. What's, what's happening to my peas? Why are they turning yellow in July? So we decided to uh, move forward with doing a big research project on that. So last year we did a field trial, uh, sorry, a field survey of about 150 fields in Alberta, all the way from southern Alberta, all the way up to uh, central Alberta, about Highway 16. Um, yeah, we went out from the first two weeks in July and the results were quite shocking because what we found was that 98% of the fields that we went into had an instance of pea root rot. So how many of you here grow peas? Not, not a lot, just a few. Okay. Um, uh, you know, so when we started looking at the res results, I think it's pretty obvious that 98% of growers are not suffering in their yield from peas, especially last year when peas did really well. So we had to start digging a little bit deeper. And when you start getting farther and farther into the data, um, what it shows is that even if you can find root rot within a field, it's really, really patchy distribution. Um, and what it really needs, and we say that this is above normal precipitation for the spring. Well, in the past three years that I've been here, there seems to be, this seems to be the normal <laughs> precipitation. So I think that's the pattern that we're seeing is that we need this really wet sort of rain event to get the soils uh, nice and soggy. Uh, as the soils dry out into July, that's when we see that you're getting some some root rot. So what happens when you get this, these wet events is you might have a small focal point of infection in your field where there might be some of the inoculum. If you get a little bit of flooding, that'll help spread the inoculum out and you'll start to see that your disease spreads. Um, now Southern Alberta, uh, when we did our field surveys, actually fared the best. We found that <coughs> about 50% of the roots, once you dig them up from a field, um, so we spend a lot of time in fields searching for roots uh, that are diseased. Um, and once you dig up those roots, we take them back to the lab. I think I spent two weeks sitting at the sink and at a lab bench and just raiding roots. And so about 50% of them are showing root rot. But in southern Alberta, only about 5% of the roots that we collected actually had enough damage that you would have seen that you would have, it would have started affecting yields. Uh, central Alberta didn't fare so well. The east central part of Alberta seemed to be the hardest hit where I think it was about 20% of the roots that we collected were showing significant damage that where you would have started to see um, a yield effect. Um, and so I was hoping to come out here today and find some root rot to be able to show you, but this isn't the time of year for it. Um, like right now when everything's wet, the peas are actually doing quite well. So we dug around in these winter peas here because they're flowering and this is usually when we start to see the disease show up in the field. Um, but again, because there's nice moisture here, the plants aren't stressed yet. I was barely able to find anything. We found a little tiny bit that might be root rot, it might be damage from something else. But basically uh, what we're finding is that you can't go out into a field and just do a quick assessment and say, oh, my peas look great. There's no, I don't have any root rot. You really have to start digging them up. The above ground symptoms that we're seeing don't always correlate with what's happening below ground. Um, but having said that, like when you see a pea plant looking like this, right? That's a pretty good indication that something is going below ground. Now this is right on the edge of the plot, so it could have been trampled or something else. But um, so you want to dig up your roots and really get in and look at what the roots are looking like. You have to knock off a lot of that soil to be able to see it. And what you'll usually see is that right where the seed stays attached to the developing root, that's where the rot starts to develop. You'll see these sort of reddish brown, kind of rusty looking lesions that will, you know, start at one spot on the root and then they'll eventually spread. 
and then it gets to the point where you almost have no root left like on here there's just a little bit of the tap root left you don't really get any of the secondary roots um, there and you completely lose all nodulation function uh, there's a few nodules on these but they're not pink they look like they've they're decayed and so they're no longer functioning um, so I can, these are winter peas so is there nodulation different than one? their nodulation would be different anyway yeah because normally when you pick up like some of the the uh, roots that i picked up here you're not seeing that nice pink nodulation which you'd normally see at this stage so we're kind of faking it a little bit by trying to get into the peas at the right stage but this is a different um, agronomic pack package the winter peas versus um, you know the normal peas that we're planting so and the other thing that is usually a really really good sign that you have root rot is if you break open the roots or cut, it with a knife. cut it with a knife which I don't have on me yeah yeah you will see um, here it's nice and white but usually you'll see that the vascular system is there's a nice pink ring inside of it and that's a really good indication that you have uh, fusarium root rot and that's the other question that we're looking at is what is it that's causing these root rots and why have they seemed to have really increased in the past three years and what we have found with all the isolations that we've done in the lab that it is a fusarium species that's causing it there's a lot of different fusarium species so i know as soon as i say fusarium everyone thinks fusarium head blight right it is a different species that we're finding on the peas um, and we are looking at what the host range of those fusarium species are, if they can infect um, any other uh, crop species. Um, and we are finding that most of them are pretty selective on peas. There's a few different species. I won't get into their long Latin names, but some of them are very selective on peas. Uh, some of them can maybe infect more uh, different pulse crops. And that's something that we're still looking at. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll open it up for questions and then see what interests you guys. Um, no, we haven't. And we are trying to collect that data when we go out and do the root rot surveys. We do try and get some crop history. Um, uh, you know, definitely the longer you haven't had a field in peas, the better they seem to do. Um, but what's interesting is that we're finding if you've had a history of growing peas, you know, some people have been growing them in the area for 20, 30 years. Uh, those are the fields that seem to be a little bit harder hit, probably because the inoculum has had time to increase. Uh, usually if it's the first time you've grown peas on your field, you, us you do quite well. If you're practicing about a four year crop rotation, then peas are t tend to do quite well as well. Yeah, actually, and that's part of the study that we're doing. As we go out there, we are collecting the stubble, the, the standing stubble, the straw that's remaining from crops over the period of our research project. So it's about four years. And we're looking at survival of these different inoculum on the different types of stubble. Can we assume that there's differences in cultivar tolerances to these root diseases? Nope, we can't assume that. Yeah, um, right now, pretty much every cultivar that has been tested is susceptible. There doesn't seem to be a lot of difference, partly because we're looking at um, such a big array of inoculum or different pathogens that can cause it. So because we're looking at a pathogen complex, you might have susceptibility maybe to one fusarium species, but you will still have um, our resistance to the other, right? So it's it tends to really... Um, go up and down what inoculum is in the soil and because of that trying to find resistance has been really tricky. We're not looking at something that's uh, a gene for gene resistance or a simple um, yeah, resistance package. Implication on pea leaf weevil that's feeding on nodules? That's a really good question. It's something that I talk to Hector Carcamo about, you know, about maybe trying to do a, a project um, that just never developed. So I think right now we probably can't say for sure. Certainly if the pea leaf weevil is doing some damage to the roots, fusarium is quite what we call a weak pathogen. So it needs, the plant needs to be stressed in some way in order for fusarium to be able to get in. So if you're getting some stress from that pea leaf weevil feeding, then 
you know, it's something that could happen. But right now, I think the, the research isn't there to say that for sure. How far north are you finding infection outside of the range of Pele Pele? I don't know what the range of Pele Pele is. Oh, we are finding it way up, like all the way up to Highway 16. And I know we didn't get up to the Peace River to do surveys uh, because it's a long, a long way to drive. But we're trying to get some samples from there this year. And I know that there's been indications that there's, they've had trouble up there too. So what's the range of the peel-leaf weevil? It hasn't really spread too far north of Highway Okay, North. yeah. It's getting up into the woods area. But not yeah, no, so we're definitely finding root rot all the way up there. And in fact, the that was, the, there. yeah, yeah. But that, the, like the, where the first concerns came from that area more around Edmonton, Lacombe area. Um, and then, you know, now that 50% of peas, I think are grown below Highway 1, we thought, well, it's definitely something we need to look at down here, so, yeah. Um, and then I haven't really touched on management, um, and that's partly because, uh, like many root diseases, once you find them in your field in season, there's not, there's nothing that you can do, really. You can't, everyone always asks, well, can I spray headline? What's my, what's the first fungicide that I can spray? And because you're trying to target something that's below ground, there's no fungicides that are going to target into the soil. So when we look at management, you know, we always have to stress that it's avoidance and prevention. So don't plant peas in a field where you know that you've had a really bad root rot problem before. So try and avoid putting peas into that field. Um, and everything to do with prevention is making choices before you put that plant in the ground in terms of making sure you have really high vigor seed. So you want to uh, use certified seed, uh, probably get your vigor germination test done to make sure that you have really high quality seed. Um, we recommend seed treatments just as a preventative mechanism, but I am currently also doing a study where we're looking at whether seed treatments have any efficacy on these late season root rots. Again, it's something that it might help prevent early pathogens from coming in at the more susceptible seedling stage. And if you can keep your seedlings really nice and healthy, then it's more likely that they can fight off infection later on in the season. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what sort of the research that we're targeting right now is looking at seed treatments. And we are also going to be um, evaluating a lot of the different cultivars that are out there. Not all of them have been tested specifically against this complex of fusarium. So we'll be checking if maybe there are some that have some resistance. Okay. Any other questions? Seed treatment. Pardon? What is the seed treatment most commonly used? Um, I think you ha you have to look in the the blue book. I don't want to recommend anything particularly. I we're right now we're testing all the ones that are basically registered for root rot of uh, of peas that are listed in the in the blue book. Any other questions? Something that I've observed over the years, and I'm not sure if there's any scientific data to, to back me up or uh, any other observations of it. It seems like uh, I've been growing peas, you know, since 1987. I still look back at uh, the yields we had then, and uh, it seemed like every field that has had two or more rotations of peas into it, I don't get the same bang the mm -hmm. yield that I did in the first year that yeah <laughs> yeah is there some micro thing or is there some something that's in there that that you take out in that first that's year you get a big bang for your buck and then after that it just dwindles um that's a really good question and I would say that probably what you are dealing with is these root rot organisms that are probably building up in your soil so yeah even, even last year like we uh, we acquired some of the land and it's never had yeah. 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 Another possibility yeah. would be the introduction of the mycorrhiza so you yeah. have access and better phosphorus. That is something that we're not blessed with up there. We, we are low deficient in phosphorus. phosphorus. So we have to feed it, I guess. Alfalfa, we have to feed it for four years in order to get that. So I thought maybe it's phosphorus deficiency is growing. Yeah. Yeah. And and this is a, this is a huge study and it's just the first year 
So the other thing that we are looking at from all the soils that we've collected is we are doing the chemical analysis on them to see if there are differences in some of those levels too. See, I'm, I'm a little bit further north and she's traveled. I'm north of 16, so I've never been <laughs> Trying to get there this year. <laughs> well, join me in thanking Shama. <laughs>